I mean, I was working with so many bands and guys like Brian Auger, who's just a great uh, Hammond uh, B, uh, B3 player. And uh, I would meet, you know, the, the guys who I was doing a lot of work for, a guy named Alan Rogan, and I became good friends. And he was a technician for the Rolling Stones, the Who, uh, George Harrison, Paul McCartney. Mm-hmm. And I was work. I was doing such cool work. Uh, Robert Palmer was just a, a great friend. He would come in all the time and uh, bring his Gretsch guitar in or his Telecasters. And and Maggie Bell was a famous artist there, and she'd come in. And and uh, so it, it was really a neat place. <laughs> Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Tuning in. I want to say a quick thank you to my guest on last week's episode, drummer, producer, composer, and educator, Indugu Chancellor. If you didn't get to hear it, you can listen to all of our episodes at entertalkradio.com slash making it or download our app and take us with you. Also, be sure to tune in for upcoming episodes with bassist composer, composer Nathan East, music manager, author, and creator organizer of We Are the World, Ken Cragen and singer-songwriter Melissa Manchester to talk about her upcoming 21st album, The Fellas. I'd like to take a moment to also thank the companies that help me sound my best, whether I'm performing live or in the studio recording and producing music. Blue Microphones, Seymour Duncan Pickups, Taylor Guitars, Mesa Boogie Amps, Diderio Strings and Planet Waves, Motu Digital Performer, IK Multimedia, and Exotic Effects. So often, I get asked questions about the creative process, so I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business. You're really in for a treat, as I've invited my friends, some of the best and brightest in music, to share their stories on how they have influenced the music that has shaped our lives. I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started. My guest this week is Seymour Duncan. Seymour W. Duncan became interested in guitars at a young age, and after lending his guitar to a friend who accidentally broke the pickup, Duncan decided to rewind it using a record player turntable to hold the pickup in place and rotate it while spooling wire around the pickup bobbin. He was then inspired by how the tone of the guitar had changed for the better and started learning more about pickups from guitarist inventor Les Paul and later mentor and humbucker inventor Seth Lover. Having developed considerable skill working on guitars, Duncan gained employment at the Fender Soundhouse in London, where he started working on the instruments and pickups of artists including Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, and Jimmy Page. After moving to California, he met and married Kathy Carter and decided to start a pickup rewinding service. With demand for his services growing, Duncan and Carter eventually expanded into offering their own Stratocaster, Telecaster, and humbucking pickups, and within two decades had a full assortment of pickups for electric bass and acoustic guitar, as well as electric guitar accessories. In 2012, Seymour Duncan was inducted into the Vintage Guitar Hall of Fame for contributions to the music industry, and he continues to create pickups in the Seymour Duncan factory in Santa Barbara, California. Please welcome my guest today, Seymour Duncan. Hi, Seymour. Hi, guys. How are you doing there, Terry? It's great to hear from you. Thank you. I'm doing great, and it's great to hear from you as well. You're up in Santa Barbara right now at the factory correct? Right. We're at the factory here and uh, everybody's on the production floor winding. And I have MJ in here with me and a few other employees and they're going to help me in case I forget something. Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. And we talk about, you know, when you get older, boy, I'll tell you, I mean, I've been doing <laughs> this for, for like, what, 40 some years now, you know, winding right. pickups and everything. And, and it's, it's been an adventure. And, and the great thing about it is I've traveled around the world many times and I've met so many great 
guitarists like yourself and, you know, working with uh, various guitar companies from, you know, Heritage and just, you know, Gibson and Fender. And so for me, it's been a, a great uh, you know, journey. I love it. I'm, I'm very excited about it. And meeting all the great guitar players out there and these young young players. And I remember seeing young guys come up to me. And uh, now it's like guys like, you know, Joe Satriani, Eric Johnson, all these great players that I met. I'm watching them grow and uh, develop over the years. So it's been pretty cool. Yeah. And, you know, as a guitar player, it's it's cool from our end. I'll speak personally, because to to have the opportunity in it, first of all, primarily our friendship comes first. I, I, I love that we've been friends for so many years, but, but it's also very cool as a player to be able to come to you and say, I'm in search of, of, of a tone I'm, I'm, I'm that I'm chasing, or I, I, how do I make this guitar sound the best? And, and, you know, to be able to collaborate with you as, as a fellow musician with your technical knowledge is really always exciting and rewarding for me as, as an artist. So thank you for, for that. I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, part of it, like you said, is so many kids come and it, it is kind of confusing, you know, and because all the guitars, like maybe Fender Strats or Les Pauls, they sort of look alike. But there are so many variances in the uh, guitar itself from the wood, from the different finishes on it, uh, the weight of the wood, uh, the type of wood. And that is all going to change your uh, final sound of, of that, that pickup. And also the... Um, Potentiometers have a lot to do with it, you know, and uh, in the height of the pickup. So uh, all that can really change the tone of a pickup. So when we get an artist coming in, and uh, it's, it's really pretty neat to work with them or they'll bring their guitar by. They'll send it to MJ in the custom shop, and we'll take it apart, and we'll measure uh, the weight of it. And, and we listen to the wood, and it's very important, you know. And being a guitar player... I can understand where these guys are coming from and I feel like they're a doctor almost, you know, and they bring <laughs> right. this thing and they have a problem and I try to uh, do the best to analyze what, what they're looking for and put it into the term of a, another type of guitar pickup for them. So it, it, it's really neat and, and everything's different. They're all different, you know, and it's a, a great challenge. In fact, I've done so many uh, that, you know, MJ and I, we have our own language in the custom shop when we're mm -hmm. uh, working with an artist, you know, which is right. kind of fun, you know. And uh, so it's it's neat having that opportunity and and these kids trust you and they're looking for something. And it's so important to be able to help them. And that's the part that I love is helping somebody get their their sound, you know. And I had Michael Sambello come to me years ago and he was looking mm -hmm. for the sound in the studio and uh, I made these custom stack pickups. He was like the first guy that got them. And uh, he recorded the song Maniac with him. And he got right. a, uh, just a, like song of the year, I believe. And just, just incredible. And then, um, so doing things like that, you know, you come up with something that is needed for what these people are looking for, you know. And, and that's the fun part of it, all the projects that we've done. Right. Even I'm, I'm remembering now uh, back in the late 80s, 90s, when I was working on a late night talk show, music directing, and we had fluorescent lights. And I went and had a conversation with you about, you know, noise canceling pickups that still sounded great, you know, yeah. with, with, you know, with having to deal with that, that issue of, of, um, you know, having electrical buzz. current. <laughs> yeah, bus. <laughs> yeah. But you did. You, yeah, right. You get yeah. Um, be, you know, as we spend the next hour talking about your company, I also want to just start off by by taking people back to your your early years. But even before that, I want to I want to start by paraphrasing your anthem, the Seymour Duncan anthem that stated on your website, because I think it's really important. We stand for great music and the people who make it. We're an American original. We live for these moments. We live for these tones. We work with heart and soul and grit and love. Our experience, our passion, our history, it's in everything we build. This is Seymour Duncan, real soul, genuine tone. I think that sums you up but and also your company. And I love that that you have that, a longer version of that on your website. Yeah, it's... Um... You know, it's just it's it's just being given the people 
what they need for one thing and, and trying to really understand what they need and, and to be there for them. You know, it's very important, you know, and, you know, Seymour Duncan company isn't just me. You know, I mean, it's, it's all the employees that we've had here for almost 40 years, you know, at the, at the Seymour Duncan company and, uh, and having folks like MJ and, and Jose on the production floor, he's one of our, our longest employees, you know, and Kevin Beller, you know, the engineer, Right. So ha- having guys like that, uh, it's, it's so important to me uh, to have that as your your company, you know, as your background. And, and the people are Seymour Duncan. You know, they're all Seymour Duncan on the production floor. You know, they're you know, I don't make all the pickups and right. these guys are doing it. And the ladies and guys are doing it every day. You know, and it, to me, it's pretty amazing how they uh, have that tenacity. You know, with me, I. I I like new projects all the time, and but for them they can keep still making the uh, the JBs. I mean, we make more JB <laughs> model pickups than I can possibly imagine, you know. And uh, and I originally did it for you know Jeff Beck way back uh, in the days when we did uh, when he did the Blow by Blow album, you know. And mm-hmm. I was very fortunate to uh, be working with him back then, you know. And and today it's still one of the biggest selling pickups and everything, and it's just. Um, even though it doesn't make you play like Jeff Beck sometimes, <laughs> right. it, it, it just gives you a good feeling that you know that you, you're able to if you, you if you can go for it. It's a goal almost. You know, having right. that pickup will will help you, uh, you know, keep playing and, and inspire you a little bit. You know, which is so important. Right. You know, and, and for me, it, that's the cool part of it. You know, and. Uh, uh, everybody has a different idea or a different approach to how they play guitar, you know, and, and I get asked all the time, who are my favorite guitar players, you know, and, and the hard part about that is, you know, in what category, I mean, you got the blues players, you got the jazz players, you got the, uh, rock players and stuff. And, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty much traditional to my original players. Like I grew up with Dwayne Eddy watching him and, Neil LeVang used to be on the Lawrence Welk show and uh, he was, he was a great inspiration, you know, and, and I've become friends with, with both of them. And also uh, like for me, the ventures, that was my, my biggest uh, favorite band and they still are, you know, my and, first uh, record play along with the ventures. Oh, exactly. You know, right. and, uh, and to me, you know, they, it was, a uh, you know, I was an only child growing up and I lived in Southern New Jersey and it was pretty, pretty lonesome back there. And, uh, and you know, we had the Lawrence Welk show, and that's where I saw Neil LeVang, you know. And then uh, I remember hearing a Soul Twist with uh, King Curtis, you know, and he had hmm. uh, a great guitar player playing with him. And then a band called The Fireballs, which were a great band. They, they had a record called Quite a Party and, and uh, Torque and all these great songs, you know. So I was always trying to find records where I could listen to these guitar players, you know. And my dad bought me a... Uh, called a, a voice of music tape recorder. So then I could record like the Lawrence Welk show. And if I was watching bandstand, I'd watch the, uh, the bands playing on there and, and record mm-hmm. them. So I could see what chords they were playing. And the neat thing about the ventures is I learned how to play in like an a seventh chord from Don Wilson, you know, right. <laughs> he was yes. Showing it. He was playing that chord on the, the ventures album, you know? So for me, uh, and then I started hearing uh, a guy by the name of Al Viola, who's just a great, jazz player and uh and then barney kessel and uh you know uh tony matola which i'm i'm sure you're familiar with you know yes. yeah and yeah. Uh, and over the years i would hear this uh, guitar player by the name of uh bob bain who uh did peter gunn you know wrote he did the lick you know the peter mm-hmm. gunn thing and so over the years we've become friends you know and uh, so for me it's having that friendship and camaraderie and, and knowing that, uh, these guys will, you know, tell you anything that you would ask them about their guitars and stuff. And, and for me, that was the coolest thing in the world. And another big hero is James Burton. You know, my youngest son, Derek Burton was named after James and, uh, Derek Burton Duncan. So for me, uh, James has always been a, such a kind heart and his whole family, you know, I, I've loved them ever since I met him back in right. the, uh, uh, mid seventies and everything. And, uh, We've done a lot of shows together, and another great player who recently had medical problems is Jerry Donahue, and uh, yeah. Jerry's been a longtime friend for years and years. So, meeting people like that to me is so important, you know, and and become friends with them, and 
then we've done shows together and they would help me do all these different shows or the Nam jams and the, uh, during the Kramer days when we had Eddie Van Halen and stuff, you know, and mm-hmm. I'd always have, uh, had all the, the great bands and then, and for years and years working with Billy Gibbons, you know, back when I first started the company, Billy Gibbons has always been there for us and it's given us great advice and, uh, we come up with great products for him and, and cool ideas and everything for him. And, and, uh, so for me, it's in that respect, it's really pretty cool, you know, and I, I couldn't ask for anything else, but it's again, you know, and it's fun for the company when uh, we have celebrities. Uh, one of our friends is uh, Bruce Greenwood. He was, uh, uh, and that, he's an actor. He was in Double Jeopardy with Ashley Judd. He was Captain Pike in Star Trek the movie. Ah, uh, right. Uh, one of the one of the issues. But he's he's a guitar fanatic, and he loves it. He'll bring his guitars up here, and we'll work on them and take care of them. And and so things like that for me is, is what's it's fun, and it's good for the employees here to meet some of these people that would come in and stuff, you know. You know, so hearing you talk time. about hearing you talk about all of these these artists that you work with and talking about the people that work with you at the factory, it feels like you're speaking about your family. Yeah, I think so. You know, because they've been my family, you know, right. you know, when, you know, I've seen them have babies and children and get married yeah. and, and uh, you know, go to the school parties and all this. And, and uh I go to MJ's house and she's got all the tamales and the enchiladas and everything. And MJ is a great cook, by the way, you know, she's fantastic. I know. I've, I've, I've had her tamales when I've been up and, <laughs> yeah. and work, but working in, uh, the custom shop, you know, it's, 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 it's really a, uh, a piece of history, you know, and, and, and it's really kind of cool. With, like working with Seth lover, you know, who invented the humbucking pickup for Gibson and, I've got his original winder that he wound all his prototypes on when mm. he got his first patent and everything for Gibson. And, and Seth, Seth was such a, a great man. And, and, uh, and he loved coming up here and hanging out with the, all the crew here at Seymour Duncan. And, and it, it's, it's really been pretty neat, you know, and all the NAMM shows I've done, God, how many, 80, 89 NAMM shows or something, That's you know, incredible. two a year. And then, yeah. uh, there's so many, and, and we're always involved in something with the NAMM shows, and then all the people that you meet there, they become your friends over the years, and it's it's pretty it's really pretty amazing, you know. They like, do. Hey, we're heading into our first break, Seymour. Okay. Um, when, we, when we come back, I, I want to talk a little bit more about how Seth Lover and Les Paul were such a great influence and open to sharing information with you, and also uh, talked about your Uncle Bid Furness, who started right. you on um, playing guitar, so... Um, yeah. We will be right back. I'm here with Seymour Duncan, and we're going to tell more stories about your path and journey, and also, of course, about the company. So please stick around. Serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. 
Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Brew. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Morris. I'm a music and entertainment lawyer, and you are listening to Making It with Terry Wallman. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome back. I'm here speaking with Seymour Duncan. And Seymour, we were uh, just started to talk about your uncle, Bid Furness, who was a big band musician and got you started on playing guitar. Can you tell me a little bit about him and also the letter that you ended up writing to Mel Bay? Oh, you're right. Yeah, boy. Um, my uncle, Bid Furness, he, he was in a big band. He worked with like guys like Paul Whiteman's orchestra and uh, Fred Waring's Pennsylvanians. And he was a trumpet player. And uh, he knew how much I enjoyed, you know, watching the uh, Lawrence Welk show and everything. And, and the funny thing is, uh, my mom uh, had talked to the local drugstore owner. And uh, so for Christmas, I wanted this sear silver tone guitar. So I mm-hmm. would always draw pictures of guitars and everything. And uh, it was a Jupiter model that I wanted. And uh, so for Christmas, when I was uh, 12 years old, uh, I saw the big box and I opened it up, you know, and they said, no, you can't open it yet. You got to, I had to open all the neckties and the socks I get from my aunts <laughs> right. and uncles and everything. You know? So anyway, I got to the box, I opened it up. They bought me an accordion for Christmas. Oh no. And, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you gotta be kidding. So I was, I was very disappointed at that, uh, at the accordion. I didn't want to play because she knew and told the uh, drugstore owner, pharmacist, that I would watch the Lawrence Welk show all the time. So they figured that I was watching Lawrence Welk, who would play the accordion. And uh, and so they, they got me the accordion. So I was, like, devastated. So yeah. anyway, my uh, my dad talked to my Uncle Howard and uh, and Uncle Bid Furness, and they they got me the uh, Sear Silvertone guitar uh, during the Christmas when I was 13 years old. And... Mm. So that started it. And then my Uncle Bid says, you know, I have a a friend who uh, plays guitar that, you know, you're going to have to go meet someday. So they took me to Steel Pier in Atlantic City. And Steel Pier is where that famous horse would jump off the ramp into the water. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, Yeah, that 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 was in Atlantic City. And so on Steel Pier, they had a big stage and they put me in the front row. And uh, all of a sudden, I hear dare 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 dare, and it was how high the moon, and the curtains opened up, and it was Les Paul and Mary Ford. Are you kidding? And me? I was like, I was That's I was crazy. mesmerized, you know. It's right. like seeing right. this, and Les had his uh, guitar, and Mary had her guitar, and they had microphones coming out of the top of the guitars and everything. And I just thought that was so cool, and they could talk into the microphone, and still play the guitar and move around on stage and everything. And so. After the show, uh, my uncle bid and uh, took me back to meet Les. So I started talking to Les and everything, and uh, uh, he started, you know, telling me about his guitar. And I said, "Mr. Paul, what is that thing on your guitar?" He said, "Son, this is a pulverizer." 
I call it the pulverizer. <laughs> and on it, he had a bunch of switches and push buttons where he could rewind the tape recorder that he had backstage. He had an Ampex tape recorder that Bing Crosby helped him get uh, back in the 50s. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he would hit this one button, it would rewind the tape. He would hit another one, it would hit record. And then he could play an overdub. So he would do the, the chunk, 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 the chord parts. And then he would go back and go diddly, 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 and then do another guitar part. And then over top of it, uh, he would do all this fancy stuff in the background. And then Mary Ford would be singing. He was and actually doing after, live looping way back when. Way back That's when, amazing. yeah. That's amazing. Had to be like 61 or 62 or something at the yes. time. And um, on stage, you know, so he would do it during his, his shows. And he was living in Mawa, New Jersey at the time. And with, uh, with Mary, I said, but I hear two voices coming out of Mary. And, and he says, look back there. See that lady in the, the dress over there? Yeah, it's Mary's sister. So it was Mary's sister who would be actually backstage singing harmony with her. Uh, she would be singing on front of stage. So it was like this great show, man. So I learned a lot from then. Mm-hmm. And then he told me all about how the pickup worked and everything and told me about the wire around the, uh, the magnets and, and that would go to uh, through the potentiometers and then that would go out to the jack to the amplifier. So, but that all started with my uncle Bid Furnace, you know, and then uh, my uncle Howard, my dad's brother, Howard Duncan, he was, he was a country sort of guitar player. And he showed me my first D chord, my A chord, and my G chord. Mm-hmm. Uh, when his, he had a, like a little Martin uh, guitar at the time. And I remember I was like 11 years old when I first started learning the chords. So every time I would go visit my uncle, and uh, I would sit down and want to play his guitar. And, and I, I never forgotten that, you know. And so it was, it was really neat. So that was the beginning of me wanting to play guitar. But then I was watching the Ted Mack show. And I saw a band on there. They did a San Antonio Rose. And I've been trying to find old reruns or something of the Ted Mack show where this band was playing. I'm trying to find out who the band was. Mm-hmm. But uh, the guitar player was playing, and he did a backflip. He, like, rolled backwards over, <laughs> and he did a backflip. And uh, and he was still playing the song, San Antonio Rose. So I thought that was – and I said, Dad, look at this, man. This guy is great. Man. I want to <laughs> play guitar. So – Anyway, that's when I got my first silver tone guitar, and uh, which I still have, which I, I'm really uh, oh, that's proud wonderful. to have it. You know, so that was yeah. that was neat. But that's how I met Les Paul, and Les Paul mm-hmm. and I have been friends ever since. You know, and uh, I would call him on the phone and talk to him, and I'd see him at all the NAMM shows, and we'd get together, and he'd give me a big hug and everything, and mm-hmm. uh, so it was pretty amazing. You know, really neat. So you also. Um... You, I read a story that that you uh, saw a Mel Bay guitar course in a music store, and and you actually wrote out, you drew out some chord patterns, and and wrote a letter to Mel Bay asking what yeah. the names of the chords were. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, uh, the neat thing about it was, uh, I was about, I was probably about thirteen, and I told him that I lived in a town where we had no music stores, and. So I wrote him a letter saying that, you know, here's the chords that I saw, like the Ventures playing on their album. What chord is this called? You know, and everything. And um, mm-hmm. honestly, it was, it was really pretty, pretty neat. So it was like two months later, and uh, I got this thick package in the mail. You know, I never received mail that much, you know. And, right, uh, you're a kid. <laughs> and, yeah, a little kid, you know. And all of a sudden it said, you know. you know, Wayne Duncan. You know, I, was, I used to be mm-hmm. Wayne Duncan. I, I used Seymour because of of finding things. And I would look on the ground. So a bandmate call, started calling me Seymour Duncan back in uh, about 1965, 66. So that was cool. been my nickname ever since, you know? And so the W so, is Wayne. Yes. Yeah. For Wayne. Yeah. yeah for Seymour great. W. Duncan. And uh, so Mel, you know, I, I saw Mel Bay at one of my earlier NAM shows back in the eighties. And I said, Mr. Bay, I said, you won't, you know, you'll never remember this, but I was, you know, I was 13 years old and I wrote to you. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you sent me all your, all your core books and all your lesson books, you know? And I said, I, I can't tell you enough how much I always appreciated that, you know, what you sent to me. And, uh, he just looked at me, you know, he almost had tears <laughs> in his eyes. He says, wow. you're Seymour Duncan. You're that guy that I sent those books to back then, you know? And I said, yeah. And I, he says, oh my God. And he just gave me a big <laughs> hug, you know? 
and I almost get tears thinking about it, you know, because he was such a, uh, he was so appreciative that uh, what he did. And then here I am, this guitar pickup builder, you know, and right. he just, uh, that was so fantastic, you know, that here's this kid that he sent the books to, and now I'm doing what I'm doing, you know? And yeah. so for me, that I was very honored to uh, have met him and talked to him. Oh, beautiful. And, and uh, you know, you just never that, know. Seymour, you just never know when you know the yeah. the effect that you have on people when when you well, make a kind gesture or listen or care. Oh man, yeah, to me that, that was so so important, you know. And yeah. uh, it's like you know meeting Seth's lover too, you know. It's just right. he was always such a gentleman. He would come to the show, the early Nam shows, and uh, he he was like my mentor. I mean, I I would go down and visit him in Garden Grove, California, and. Uh, so to have a chance to do something for him and work with him and and uh, it, it was it was neat. It was really sad because he was just uh, going around uh, de- delivering uh, old vacuum cleaners that had been repaired, and that he mm-hmm. was making like sixty dollars a month uh, retirement from a uh, Gibson and Fender, you know. And, mm-hmm. and I said, man, there's something wrong here with this, you know, because mm-hmm. of a man who created such a great pickup that just about every guitar company uses. And he's only making sixty dollars a month retirement. You know, I just thought right. that was so sad. You know, so Evan Scott at the time and myself, we went down and we brought him up to Santa Barbara, and we said we want to try to do something. You know, and we wanted to, uh, you know, make a Seth Lover model pickup. You know, and uh, and we talked about you know the money part of it, and mm-hmm. uh, and we gave him a price and everything, and he says no, 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 and uh, I said well. You know, that's what we, we can we can give, you know, we can do. And he said, no, it's too much, you know. I said, too oh, much. <laughs> yeah, he said, that was too much. You know, and he says, you know, he says, I said, Seth, man, you know, this is this is great for you. And I said, maybe you can use it for your grandchildren or something or help them in school or right, something, right, you know. And uh, right. he says, yeah, that's a great idea. So that's what he so did. He you took know? it. And uh, so for me, uh, having him to do that, he loved MJ here in the custom shop and we were always mm-hmm. making stuff and. And when Seth, uh, he passed away several years ago, you know, his family called me uh, and said, you know, Seth wanted you to have all his stuff. I said, what do you mean? He says, yeah, his whole garage is yours. You know, you can mm-hmm. come down and take everything out of it. And he had all kinds of, and we were both in the ham radio too. And that's how I really got started uh, messing around with electronics and everything. And uh, mm-hmm. so he had his radio stations and, and, uh, but all the, all his prototype stuff that he did, all his all his test equipment and everything, and a lot of it I, I had given to the uh, amateur radio club here in Santa Barbara, because he just had a garage full, you know. I mean, right. it was just so much stuff. And but uh, he gave us the original humbucking pickup that was used to apply for the patent apply for humbucker back in 1955, mm. you know. So uh, uh, you also have his uh, early winders too, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I have his early winder. And uh, the one that he did the, the prototypes on with, and, mm. and the, the prototype humbucker, they were made out of P90 bobbins that he cut down, so he could make uh, two bobbins instead of the one, and then he would wind them in the same direction, but hook them up where they were electrically out of phase with each other, and then having a magnet, a magnet which had the magnetic field that was reversed in each coil, each bobbin with pole pieces, that made it humbucking. But it was quiet, and that was just a fantastic design. And it was all like ham radio transformer design and everything, which he, he got all that. And, and Seth had taught in the military, the Navy, uh, when he was back in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, you know, electronics and everything, which is so cool. So right. when he passed away, he gave me all his books. I have all the uh, uh, his notes from Gibson when he did all the, uh, uh, the pickups and everything, and he mm-hmm. did the— Deluxe humbucker pickup. He did the Fender uh, wide space humbucker uh, for them. So a lot of that cool things and a lot of history. It's just fantastic, you know. And, it really and is. Everybody, everybody just loved him here at Seymour Duncan. He, and he was always laughing and joking. <laughs> His wife, Levon, she was uh, uh, every time we'd go down and visit, she'd always want me to have tea. She would always, always make me Lipton tea with a, <laughs> uh, cream and sugar, which I'm so much. <laughs> Never forgot her about that. that. And she was sweet. I mean, just a wonderful lady. You know, just beautiful. That's a sweet lady. memory. Yeah, yeah, very good memory. Oh my gosh, you know. So, so Seymour, ha, ha, how did you end up going to London to work for Fender Soundhouse? That that seemed like a bold move. 
did you know people there or did you just no, get on a plane uh, and fly over there? Well, what happened was um, uh, Roy Buchanan was playing. He had his first album out and everything, and he was going to do a European tour. And I was good friends with Jay Rich, who was uh, Roy Buchanan's manager in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Roy was living in the, the Washington, D.C., the Maryland area, uh, you know, down south on the East Coast. And uh, so he uh, said, you know, why don't you join me in London? And at the time, I was working for uh, WCPO-TV in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I was doing shows like the Nick Clooney show. And Nick Clooney was uh, Rosemary Clooney's younger brother mm-hmm. and the father of George Clooney. And so I was working the show every day with them and stuff, and then— uh, uh, the manager started getting on me because I had long hair and everything. And, <laughs> and I had done shows with, uh, uh, Jerry Reed in Cincinnati. And, uh, so for me being there, uh, and I was sort of getting, you know, tired of it. And I had gotten a job through a, a guy by the name of Charlie Scripps and his father was Charles Scripps senior, who was Scripps Howard broadcasting. And they owned all the TV, a lot of TV stations and radio stations. And he said that, you know, uh, I could get you a job. So that's when I was working in TV. But I wanted to play more music. So mm-hmm. TV was great. And I was, I was a puppeteer on the Uncle Al show. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I did marionettes and uh, a lot of crazy stuff. Yes. <laughs> it was fun. I mean, we had a good time. And then uh, uh, so then uh, Roy Buchanan was playing in town. And I was talking to him. He says, well, why don't you come over to uh, England? So I went to England and I flew over and uh, I had been uh, playing around. I was doing sessions and everything for Polydor mm-hmm. Records. And uh, right. Jay Rich introduced me to the, the folks at Polydor. And I was working with a guy. His real name was Chris Harley, but he went by the name of Chris Rainbow uh, because there was al- already an- another guy named Harley, uh, Steve Harley, I think, mm-hmm. from uh, another band I was playing around. So... Uh, Chris and we were doing, we had a lot of records. We did a record called Solid State Brain and Give Me What I Cry For. And a lot of his stuff, I think, is on iTunes and maybe Amazon. I'm not really sure, mm-hmm. but he was a singer who loved the Beach Boys and Karen Carpenter. We were just good friends with him and everything. And, and um, so, but if you, he did a song called uh, Dear Brian. And he did all the harmonies that sounded just like the Beach Boys. You know, he did everything himself. And he would just amaze everybody when we were in the studio. And I would just watch him just, he'd do one track and then go back and do another track. And then those two tracks would be ping pong to another. And he was doing Mm. like eight harmony tracks, just absolutely incredible. And uh, so with him, I uh, got over there. And then there was an ad in the newspaper. uh, I forget the New Musical Express, I think, that the Fender Soundhouse was opening up in London and they were looking for technicians or somebody that could uh, work in the repair shop with a guy named Ron Roca. And uh, so Ron was the uh, electronic repairman there and they were looking for a, like a guitar guy. So I said, God, Seymour, I let's hold that. Let's hold that yeah. thought. We're going into our next commercial break. Okay, um, when we come back, we'll finish the story about how you started at Fender Soundhouse and started working with Jimi Hendrix and Jimmy Page, Jeff okay. Beck, Eric Clapton and, and talk about a very unique personal hobby that you have as well. We'll be right okay. back with Seymour Duncan. Adam Berry, and you're listening to Making It with Terry Wolf. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear, host of Sound Experience here on InterTalk Radio. And Source Connect by Source Element is the essential tool that we use to link between my studio in Austin, Texas, and the WS radio station in San Diego. Now, with Source Connect, not only can we communicate in real time and with HD audio, but it's synced up and is of a high enough quality that I can use it for real time ADR work, remote recording, and overdubbing, and it even allows me to remotely control a DAW. Source Connect by Source Element, affordable, high quality audio and video video connection over the internet for all of your production needs. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio 
and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. The Moyer Entertainment Group, in conjunction with Promark, Dunlop, and Deadline Media, is keeping music in our local schools and presenting local talent to the world through the Temecula Valley Music Awards. Submissions for entry into the TVMA 2017 season are now open in all genres, including a youth category for artists under 18, for the October 7th Star Studded Awards Show, where 100% of the proceeds go towards supporting local music education in the Temecula Valley. Details, tvmawards.org. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com Bonjour, c'est Jean-Luc Ponty, le violoniste, et vous écoutez Making It avec Terry Woolman. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome back. You are listening to the music and the stories of Seymour Duncan. And Seymour, you were just talking about when you had gone to London and there was an opening that you saw for a technician at Fender Soundhouse. Yeah, it was it was pretty neat, you know. And uh, my manager, who was working with uh, the Chris Rainbow and myself, uh, he saw an ad in one of the newspaper papers, and it said Fender Soundhouse looking for a technician. So I went over and. Uh, I, I walked in and the guy says, can you, you know, do work on guitars at all? I said, oh, of course, yeah, I can do it, you know. And uh, so he said, there's a few here. And there's like 23 guitars that needed to be worked on, you know. And, mm-hmm. and he said, you know, we got to sort of get these done. And I got them all done in like three hours. You know, he was like <laughs> totally amazed, you know, that I could do this and fix this and fix that and fix the bridge and put new nuts right. on and and uh, intonation and new strings and all this stuff. So. Uh, the guy, Ron Roca was there. And, uh, so, uh, he hired me right on the spot, which was really neat. So I would go there. Uh, it was, it was called, it was on Tottenham court road. It was the original Fender sound house. And I was there with the, uh, the secretary for Ivor Arbiter. Arbiter was the guy, I think he did the, uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Arbiter Fuzzface, And he was the backer behind that and everything. And, uh, mm-hmm. He, he was a real big uh, distributor for Europe, and they were a Fender uh, distributor also. So for me, it was really pretty cool. So they would get guitars in and pieces, and I would put them together for artists who would order a special guitar. It may be like a Strat with a maple neck or a rosewood neck or a Telly with a rosewood neck or this or that, you know, and I would set everything up and get it adjusted, put strings on it. So I worked on hundreds and hundreds of guitars. So it was really, really pretty cool. But the secretary was a girl by the name of Anita Pollinger. And Anita and I were really good friends, and we would have a great time. And they had, a, uh, like, a, a, a restaurant in this uh, the sound house, which was kind of neat. And we'd go down and make grilled cheese sandwiches and everything. And later in the year, she married uh, Davy Jones from the Monkees. Oh, perfect. And, uh, <laughs> so for me, that was neat. And we've kept in contact after all these years. But... Uh, the neat thing about working there was, I mean, I was working with so many bands and guys like Brian Auger, who's just a great oh. Hammond uh, B, uh, B3 player. A, a he would come Express. in and yeah. he was playing with uh, Julie Driscoll at the time and uh, band called Trinity. And uh, I would meet, you know, the, the guys who I was doing a lot of work for, a guy named Alan Rogan, and I became good friends. And he was a technician for the Rolling Stones, the Who, uh, George Harrison, Paul McCartney. 
mm-hmm. and I was work. I was doing such cool work. Yeah, Robert Palmer was just a, a great friend. He would come in all the time and uh, bring his Gretsch guitar in or his Telecasters, and and Maggie Bell was a famous artist there, and she'd come in, and and uh, so it, it was really a neat place, you know, to be, and, and everybody was hanging out, and we had a roadie room, and uh, uh, how many oh, years were you there? About. Three, two and a half years. Mm-hmm. But uh, there was a band, uh, Mark Bowen from T Rex, was rehearsing mm-hmm. there all the time. And then I met a, a group called Druick and Laurence that wanted me to go on a short tour with them. We went to Germany and they were produced uh, by, I think his name was Nigel Thomas. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a record out coming out. I actually recorded on it and uh, called Druick and Laurence. And uh, Dwight Drewick, he's a great singer. And Kurt Larange mm-hmm. is a great sly player. From he lives in Australia now. Mm-hmm. But those guys, we've we've been friends all the, all these years and everything. And and their manager, Nigel, was uh, Joe Cocker's uh, manager. So uh, we went on tour, and uh, we were in Germany playing in Hamburg, Germany, the Zoom Club over there. Mm-hmm. And later in the years, I played with Jack Bruce over there at the Zoom Club. And mm-hmm. uh, Jack Bruce would come by the Fender Sound House all the time, and. He was always talking about how Les Pauls should have, like, you know, all these guys are using uh, wimpy strings on their Les Pauls, you know, like 10s and 9s and everything. He said, mm-hmm. oh, they should have 11s on them and 12s, mm-hmm. you know, and all this stuff. So it was it was pretty funny. But meaning, and then when I first went there, I was hanging out with Jeff Beck, and I went to a show to see one of uh, the Who's uh, farewell tours, I guess, you know, or maybe it was a reunion tour. But I'm up in the balcony of the Rainbow uh, Club. And uh, I'm standing there, and this lady comes to me. She says, are you a drummer by any chance? I said, no, no, no. I'm just a, I'm a guitar tech. I'm working now at the Fender Soundhouse. I just got a job there. I'm doing guitar repair and everything, and I'm working for Jeff and, and a bunch of guys. And I swear to God, she says, well, if you can, here's our number. Uh, give us a call if you think of any drummers that may be able to get uh, a job with us, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh and I looked at it, and it said, uh, Lyndon Paul McCartney. I said, you are kidding me. And it was Lyndon <laughs> McCartney talking to me. I swear to God. And uh, wow. And I looked over to Jeff, and here was Paul McCartney talking to him. And here I am in England for like a month, <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm meeting the Beatles. You know, I mean, I just thought right. it was so cool, you know. And uh, and then a minute later, this guitar- other guy comes up. He was playing, I think it was Thin Lizzy at the time. It was Gary Moore. Uh-huh. And so I got to meet him, and we became friends over there and everything. So uh it was it was it was pretty cool and then another cool thing when i was there uh i went to a place in uh, Fulham called the greyhound and i there was a band called stray dog playing uh with a guy a guitar player named snuffy walden oh, and of the, the other band was free with paul kossoff and, and paul rogers and everything mm. and uh, i saw their last show that they played together be- before paul rogers the band split and he started mm. bad company but I was there playing Paul Rogers guitar or Paul Kossoff's old Les Paul and everything. And uh, we were doing, you know, figuring out how to adjust it and everything. So I have great memories of being over there and meeting some of these great guitar players, you know, and like, you know, Brian Auger and I were still friends. And when he's in town or I meet him, you right. know, he sent me, he was a Capitol Records recording and he signed a photo to me that was a picture of Les Paul and Mary Ford in the recording studio at Capitol Records. And uh, they were going to, Capitol Records, Studio A, I think, they were cleaning it out, and they were going to throw this eight, like a four-by-five photo. They were going to throw it away, mm-hmm. and uh, he got it out of the dumpster, and uh, he, he brought it up to me, which I thought was fantastic. You know, I've never forgotten that. So that's pretty cool. Let's um, talk about we've, – we've got about 10 minutes left in the show. I want to ask you about flint napping. Flint napping, yeah. Yeah. Um, as, as a kid, I was an only child. I'd walk to school every day, and – and, uh, you know, I'd go to school and I'd walk through because South New Jersey is all farm fields and a lot of farm fields. And uh, so I walked to school and I walked through the farm fields after they would plow it and I'd pick up artifacts, old arrowheads, and I'd find hatchets and axes and all this stuff that were just from the Lenai Lenape Indians in uh, South New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I would get to school and the teacher said, OK, what did you find today? So I'd pull all these rocks out of my pockets and stuff. So. Ever since I was a little kid, I, I'd be finding artifacts. And uh, so over the years, I just started uh, 
you know, making them, you know, and I met a guy named Jim Hopper at a, a show up in Oregon, uh, Portland, Oregon, back in the 80s. And uh, he was he's one of the best flint nappers out there. And we went to a place called Glass Butte in uh, central Oregon and uh, where you could get the raw obsidian out of the ground and we would dig it up. And then I met guys like, uh, oh, uh, George Eklund, who's another ABO uh, flint napper. Mm -hmm. He'll use uh, all the percussive to make all his spear points and everything. And he works with a lot of great uh, flint nappers and museums and everything. So guys like him, I started talking to. and uh, uh, But I started making them, you know, probably 10 years ago, I guess, 8 to 10 years ago. And uh, I've become very obsessed by doing it. So <laughs> I make a lot of arrowheads. You know. Do you do you find them out in Santa Barbara? No, not or, too many. Plus so you're not it's more when you're traveling. You're not allowed to pick them up. Hmm. There's oh. the Antiquity Act, and you're not allowed to uh, really right. uh, pick them up or take them from lands or public lands unless you have permission to go on the land, for one thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But I do a lot of research with them. I'm on the uh, Stone Age Institute board in Gosport, Indiana, with uh, – mm -hmm. Nick Toth and Kathy Schick, and uh, they made me like an honorarium of the museum and their uh, uh, Stone Age Institute. And they study early man with a leaky foundation, and uh, they mm -hmm. go to Africa uh, all the time to study early man. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. really early man. They have several books out. They did the uh, Wal Walter Cronkite series called uh, Caveman, and, and uh, so it's pretty neat, you know. So I've met yeah. some great people. Yeah. By flint napping, and I find out a lot of guitar players are flint nappers too. So uh, a lot of guys write to me on Facebook and stuff, which I'm not on that much, but right, it's a fun place to uh, meet some of these people. And yeah, uh, what, uh, what, what a great obsession a fun, to have. Fun, yeah, it's a fun hobby, you know. And, yes. and uh, when I go on trips, I, I take my flint napping kit with me, and uh, I'll talk to guitar players, do seminars. And Danny Gatton and I were avid uh, arrowhead hunters, and and uh, he loved that I was making arrowheads, and I would send him stuff you know, years ago and everything. So that's how I did it. But I, I just love it. It's, it's a good hobby to do, and it's good exercise, too, because when I do it, I do a lot of sweating. It's good for the arms and right. shoulders. You know. Thanks so, for sharing that with me. It's, a, it's so it's, fascinating. It's a, hobby. it's a great hobby, you know, and they'll be around for a long time, too, I think, you know, the arrowheads. <laughs> We're yeah. heading towards the end of our conversation. Before I ask you the final question, I wanted to ask you uh, to just talk about Notes for Notes and, and any of the other organizations that you're involved with, because I know you are a strong proponent for education and keeping music alive and art. And so talk about yeah. that for a moment. Well, Notes for Notes is a, uh, a charity and an event that we do just about every year. And we do, we'll do a concert. And we've done it with Los Lobos and Steve Miller Band. We've had uh, oh Peter Frampton did it with us. You know, uh, Joe Bonamass is a big, big fan. And mm -hmm. uh, oh god, how many? God, we've done a bunch of them. And uh, but Jimmy Vivino is one of our really helpers from the Conan O'Brien show. You know, he's mm -hmm. the music director for Conan, and so he'll come out and uh, bring his whole band with us and with him. And uh, so we'll all get up and and jam with everybody, which is really neat. We had Don Felder from the Eagles come up and play us. You know, Al mm -hmm. Parsons, who's a, a local here, and uh, which is, he's fantastic. And I hope to be re recording with him pretty soon, too, up at the studio, his nice. new studio. We mm -hmm. had Slash come here and play with us and stuff, which is really pretty cool. I mean, it's just fantastic. And uh, so I'm excited. I played in Germany with uh, Ingve Maustein, which is really pretty neat. I did a big wow. show there, a big, big charity mm -hmm. event that they did over there. And, uh, but Santa Barbara is, you know, we try to help as much as we can here doing different events and, and, uh, MJ gives tours here at the factory. We get the Boy Scouts and Cub mm -hmm. Scouts coming by and we get, uh, you know, you also work with the Boys and Girls Club as well. don't yeah, you? The, yeah. That's part of the, I think the notes for notes thing, which is really mm -hmm. neat, you know, and, uh, and, you know, they have, uh, those they've opened up in what Nashville now and they have one in Detroit, Nashville, San Francisco. San Francisco. I, one in no, Miami, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Venture in Los Angeles. So, I mean, that, and it's all these, and we got so many other artists that come in and want to help and do events. And uh, it's really, really neat. You know, I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty, pretty excited that uh, to do that. It makes you feel good to be able to give back to these young kids and get them inspired and 
we'll make pickups for them or we'll give, you know, donate guitars to them and everything. Mm-hmm. And we have other people donating products to them and stuff. So it's, it's, it's just a great event, you know, for everybody. We all have a good time doing Steve it. Steve Miller likes the program so much that he wants to do another show. Yeah, today. Steve Miller wants to do another show with us here in Santa oh, Barbara. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, which is fantastic. It is. It's great, you know. And uh, we have a good time. And, and uh, you know, he, you know, is so important. And, uh, and like Peter Frampton, too. Guys like that mm-hmm. we, I've known for so many years. And, and they, they want to help, too, which is so neat. And it, it's good that we have those kind of people that really help us and stuff, you know. so We're, we're going to share – we're going to share a link also on notes for notes and, oh, good. and okay. so great. that people can find uh, about the great work uh, that people are yeah. doing along alongside you. Um, right. My, my closing question is something I ask all of my guests at the end of the show. Yeah. At this point of your life, Seymour, with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? Um, my younger self, I would probably just say, you know, I'm, I'm glad I had inspiration and, and approached the inspiration like Les Paul, my uncle Bid, of how they introduced me to other people and stuff. And, and I would go when I was, you know, like 13, 14, I'd go to Philadelphia to these bars and I'd see George Benson and Jimmy McGriff and uh, Jack McDuff, these Hammond B, uh, three players play. And uh, this one lady, you know, she would sit me at the bar and give me a Coca-Cola and, and uh, she would, Tell everybody to leave me alone. I'm here to see the guitar player. And I thought that was very cool. And normally, mm-hmm. you know, you couldn't get into a club or anything, but they knew I was a very, um, you know, excited about playing guitar and, and being a guitar player that I knew Les Paul and all this stuff. So that was, Les really helped me in that respect where I could go and, and visit people. But I think I was very shy when I was a kid, but having the guitar and I, I my, I had to do a book report or a, a, on a subject and my report was, how, what a guitar is all about and how to play a guitar, you know? So I did that for a school report. And, um, I, I always remember that, you know, and it was, for me, it was, uh, uh, exciting, you know, that I, I learned how to play guitar. It got me traveling. I, I've played in just about every state in the U S you know, which is so cool and, uh, playing in, you know, Japan and China and, and all over the place, Australia and New Zealand, uh, all through Europe. And otherwise, I don't know what I could have done to have that kind of travel and meet so many great players and other guitar players. And what you see, too, is every town has a great guitar player. I mean, it's really cool. And a lot of them don't want to travel or it's go so on the true. road. And uh, and there's just people that, you get, you know, you respect. I respect so many of these players out there. And uh, I want to see these young players just keep playing and don't give up and uh, just, just keep doing it, you know, just keep playing and have a great time and, learn as much as you can and meet all the guitar players you can and everybody out there will help you, you know, which is so cool, you know, and like, like me and, and me, I went towards the uh, electronic side of it with Seth Lover and, mm-hmm. and writing Mel Bay and everything. And, and these people were kind, very kind to me. And, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud, proud of that. And I'm so thankful, you know, my, all my employees and all my reps, all my guys out there selling this stuff every day. You know, I, I respect all those guys and it's hard work. It yeah, is. So we need to You've got a great team with you. We are yeah. out of time. I'm I'm so happy to have spent the hour with you, Seymour, and get to share oh, your story. You there, it's really a pleasure. Everybody go to SeymourDuncan.com. We will post the site. We will post notes for notes. And we will see you next week. Thank you, Seymour. Thank you very much, Perry, and everybody out there. Thank you. Join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on JackieScrew.com.
Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists. Using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. 